Well, I'm delighted to be here, particularly I had not realized uh, <clears throat> that Nate Garrett uh, had been a leader of this organization. Uh, so I feel at home because Nate and I uh, were trustees of Duke University together. I've known Nate a long time. Had I known he was this uh, influential, well-known, and powerful, I would have been more deferential uh, in our, my earlier years. Uh, but I am delighted to uh, be able to join you here today uh, and happy to follow uh, such a meaningful event in the inauguration uh, presentations there. Uh, I'd like to echo my congratulations to uh, the new NASB leaders and also extend uh, my gratitude to the outgoing leaders. Uh, I'm honored and privileged to be the IRS Commissioner and to participate with you and others in service to the public. In my first 10 months as the IRS Commissioner, I've learned a lot about the people of the IRS, and it's been an incredibly rewarding experience. I've talked with and listened to more than 12,000 employees across the country in town hall meetings uh, in, over, in 36 different IRS offices. Everywhere I go, uh, I use the lunch hour to have smaller gatherings with employees. Uh, and that's uh, where I discover what's really impressive is that even after four years of setbacks with pay freezes, shutdowns, furloughs, the sequester, and then the additional background noise about the IRS over the last couple of years, what's refreshing and to some extent amazing to me is the level of dedication to the mission of the agency and the energy the workforce continues to demonstrate. It's an exceptional agency and an exceptional workforce. And it's a good thing because we have a lot on our plate uh, at the IRS, in addition to delivering a successful filing season every year. Even with our resource constraints, we're making significant progress in meeting the challenges we face. And I'd like to talk about a few of them with you. We're dealing with two important statutory mandates from the Congress. One is implementing the Affordable Care Act, and the other is preparing for the global exchange of information as a result of the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act or FATCA as it's known. Both laws present unique challenges for the agency, for taxpayers and for tax professionals, and both laws will need to be folded into the filing season this coming spring. The Earned Income Tax Credit uh, program helps pull millions of working families out of poverty each year and is supported by politicians on both sides of the proverbial aisle. On EITC and a number of the refundable tax credits that we provide, we continue with our dual responsibilities of ensuring that possible beneficiaries understand their right to participate in the programs while we work to fight against refund fraud and improper payments, often the result of the complexity of the statutes. Going into 2015, another of our challenges is implementing our new voluntary education program for return preparers who are not CPAs, attorneys, or enrolled agents. We would prefer to see Congress enact legislation allowing the IRS to impose mandatory oversight of tax return preparers and minimum standards. But until that happens, we have a responsibility to ensure, to the extent that we can, that tax preparers who lack credentials meet the standards of competency and professionalism we need to uphold our system of voluntary compliance. As part of our management of this program, we are also advising taxpayers of the significant qualifications of CPAs, attorneys, and enrolled agents who spend significantly more time developing their expertise than the preparers who only complete the minimum level of continuing education offered under our voluntary program. Another complicated issue we face is dealing with identity theft and refund fraud. More than 1,200 individuals involved with tax-related identity theft were recommended for prosecution last year alone. The state of our enforcement operations is strong but we can and must do more to keep up with the evolving criminal schemes. We have taken many of the amateurs off the streets, but increasingly are confronting organized crime syndicates here and around the world. Tax scams, particularly criminals calling on the phone, claiming to be from the IRS and threatening immediately, immediate dire consequences unless payments are made, continue to be a, a pervasive threat to innocent taxpayers around the country and a threat to our system of voluntary compliance overall. We obviously don't relate to taxpayers that way. In fact, if we have an issue with a return, we initially contact the taxpayers by mail. So I've been telling the public all year through the press, if you're surprised to be hearing from us, you're not hearing from us. <laughs> with regard to the rapidly changing business environment, 
The IRS is embracing every opportunity to approach the work more efficiently, especially as the number of large partnerships is more than tripled in 10 years. Large partnership audits were the focus of a recent report by the General Accounting Office, and the real catch-22 of GAO's final conclusion is that we need funding to implement the changes recommended, changes that would ultimately yield a significant return in investment for the country in the form of increased revenue collection. One of the things that surprised me most when I first came to the IRS was the amount of time and resources and effort we dedicate to taxpayer services and helping the taxpayers, including tax professionals, determine what they owe and how most effectively to pay it. One of the things we've begun to do is define more clearly what the tax filing experience ought to look like for taxpayers three to five years down the road. Right now, we've begun to make significant improvements with applications such as Where's My Refund and Get Transcript, which have moved millions of calls off the phone and onto the website. So as our tax base changes and grows, and as expectations change, one strategy for operating in an area of sustained budget cuts is shifting even more business to low-cost online channels. The idea is that the IRS ought to offer the same type of access to your account as you expect with any major financial institution day, today, anytime, anywhere, on any device. And to a certain extent, this shift to a more robust online services concept extends to tax professionals too. IRS.gov, our website, is a rich source of information for Circular 230 tax professionals, and we continue to adapt our communications methods to more effectively reach tax pros with the information they need to practice before the IRS. In making the case for appropriate levels of funding for the IRS, I continue to emphasize that the IRS is the world's largest financial accounting institution, and that it's a tremendously risky operation to run with outdated equipment. Despite more than a decade of upgrades to the agency's core business systems, we still have technology that was running when John F. Kennedy was president, running alongside our more modern systems. This is a concern for a lot of organizations, especially ones that have been in the same business for more than 100 years. Next filing season, coming up in January, could be one of the historic, most difficult ones in terms of complexity for the IRS and by extension for tax payers and tax professionals. The Affordable Care Act and other statutory mandates like FATCA would be complicated enough, but the wild card on top of it all is what the Congress does, and when, with regard to tax extenders. I've already had conversations with and informally advised the Senate Finance Committee and House Ways and Means Committee that we need to know as early as we can what they're going to do. Significant changes in the way a tax <coughs> extender operates in calculations or in its benefits will challenge us in terms of being able to start filing season on time in January. And the longer we have an uncertain tax picture, the more difficult it becomes for everyone to do their jobs. Of course, the downstream effect for the average taxpayer is the potential for the delayed start of a filing season and for the vast majority of taxpayers who expect a refund every year, over 80% of all filers, in fact, that means a lot of unhappy taxpayers. One of our most significant accomplishments this past year, aside from dealing with a core business of taxpayer service and enforcement, has been getting greater public and congressional recognition of the agency's need for funding. The IRS is a critical agency closely tied to the fiscal health of our nation. In fact, as no noted recently, the federal deficit is down significantly this year, not because we cut expenses so much, but because the IRS helped collect more than $400 billion in additional revenues. By now, the Congress knows my message by heart. I'm trying to become even more popular up there. Uh, <clears throat> the message is you get what you pay for, and conversely, you don't get what you don't pay for. Uh, <clears throat> cutting the IRS budget is forcing us, it's like playing a football game with 10 players and lead weights in your shoes. In four years, the agency is down 13,000 permanent full-time employees. All the while, our responsibilities continue to grow with, as we just discussed, ACA and FATCA uh, as new statutory mandates and all the associated changes in our tax forms, publications, and notices. In the four years, Congress reduced the AC <coughs> IRS budget since 2010 by 7%, at the same time we have 7 million new customers uh, needing to interact with the tax system one way or another. 
To give you an idea of where we stand, the IRS budget for the fiscal year 2014 was $11.3 billion, down nearly $900 million from four years ago. We're operating under a continuing res resolution right now for 2015, and we're in a holding pattern. What we do know is that four years of reduced budget have resulted in a decline of 5,000 key enforcement personnel. It includes revenue agents, revenue officers, and criminal investigators. But there's also a deeper issue to consider. Any marked deterioration in taxpayer services and enforcement creates a longer-term risk for the U.S. tax system, which is based on voluntary compliance. If people think that their chances of ever hearing from us are diminish diminishing significantly, or if they just can't find the information they need and get discouraged, the negative impact is going to be on the compliance rate. And if the compliance rate goes down by 1%, it costs the government $30 billion a year, almost three times the entire budget of the IRS. So we'll continue working with Congress to solve the agency's budget problems. I believe the IRS budget should reflect the basic truth that the IRS funds government and, by extension, funds the national priorities we all value as citizens and taxpayers of the United States. Regulators of the accounting profession play an important role in the larger economy, and from the IRS perspective, we share a common bond in our commitment to serving in the public's interest. We share some challenges, too. Our world is changing, public expectations are changing, and the way we fulfill our mission is, by extension, changing, too. As a final note, Thank you again for the opportunity to provide an overview of the major efforts at the IRS and where we stand today. I'm told we may have time for a few questions, uh, and if that's true, I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Do we have questions for the commissioner? As I tell our employees when I do town halls, it's your chance to harass the IRS commissioner. How often does that happen? <laughs> I can't believe we don't have somebody approaching the mic. As I tell people, I'm also very good at not answering questions, and I'd be yeah, happy to demonstrate the, uh, that skill. <laughs> well, I'm not sure what uh, Walter referred in, in his, uh, what? There's somebody waving over oh. there, a questioner. We have, we have a question. I even know who that is. Now that I'm looking over that way, that light's in my eyes. Barbara. I have a question uh, in relation to the fraudulent transactions, um, the fraudulent refunds. Uh, having personally fell victim to a fraudulent return filed in my name, I was somewhat frustrated with the process in terms of calling your fraud unit etc. I think uh, as I visit with my fellow practitioners, we all have a number of clients who have faced this. And uh, it appears, I mean, we're, we're astonished at the information that these people seem to have picked up from someplace that has allowed them to file these fraudulent returns. I wondered if you could expand upon that and if you have any advice for those of us in private practice as to what we can do to protect our clients that we're not already doing, I'd like to hear it. Thanks. I know it's, it's a very good question. It's an important problem uh, <clears throat> that we have at the top of our list to deal with. Uh, the good news about it is we have it under, uh, more under control than it's been for some time. It exploded in the area from like 2010 to 2012, overwhelmed law enforcement as well as the IRS and as well as citizens. Uh, we have uh, spent a lot of time. Uh, we have 3,500 employees we devoted to it. We've trained about 40,000 IRS employees on how to deal with the situation uh, because we do think it's critically important to protect both the government, but most importantly, to, to protect taxpayers. There's nothing more threatening than having your identity stolen, filing a return, and having it rejected because someone else uh, filed in front of you. Uh, on the enforcement front, the program began originally with a set of individuals, some of them in prison, I guess with nothing else to do, who determined that if they filed quickly enough, uh, they could get a refund before the taxpayer. As I tell people, to some extent, we've leapfrogged the problem. In the old days, you got your refund from the IRS in the summer and a check. Uh, now, 85 percent of people file electronically, and we uh, say that we'll get you a refund. Eighty percent of people or more get refunds. 
uh, because most people over withhold, we'll get you a refund inside of 21 days. So I was surprised to discover we don't get the W-2s until March. So we've leapfrogged the problem in the sense that we're processing returns and sending refunds before we get the W-2s. So one of the things I've asked Congress for is the authority to get W-2s in January when employees get them, so we'll be able to match and identify more easily uh, refunds that are fraudulent. In the meantime, uh, <clears throat> there are about 1,500 people who have been taken off the street and are in jail for lengthy sentences. Uh, and as I've told people, in some ways, we've taken a lot of the amateurs off the street. Uh, but now what we're dealing with is organized crime syndicates here and around the world. Uh, and they are not filing one or two, they're filing 500 or 1,000 refund claims at a time and reverse engineering our filters, figuring out which ones go through and which ones don't. Uh, so it's an ongoing battle. We have centralized our response to it across the agency uh, to try to give taxpayers an easy way to be dealt uh, with when they have the problem, but also to coordinate our enforcement and, and uh, filtering efforts. Uh, but you're right, it used to take, when it first happened in the 2010 to 2012 era, it would take us almost a year to clean out the bad data out of your account, uh, get your return accepted, and get a refund out. Uh, as a result of a lot of improvements we've made, we have that now down to under 120 days, which we still think is too long, and we'd like to get it faster, uh, done more. But to tell you the level of the criminals we're dealing with uh, and the level of chutzpah, uh, <clears throat> uh, one of our problems is identifying when you call and say, where's my refund or what happened, why is my return not accepted, is for us to determine that you are you. Uh, there are uh, criminals and fraudsters who, in fact, having been beaten to the punch by the legitimate taxpayer, call us and want to know why we rejected their return, where's their <laughs> refund? <laughs> Uh, so, uh, authentication is a significant challenge for us. Uh, one of the things in our vision for uh, going forward into the future is to try to make authentication easier for taxpayers, easier to remember, and more secure uh, as we go. So we have a, a significant uh, in, uh, criminal enforcement effort underway. There are 1,200 indictments outstanding right now, and our conviction rate is over 90 percent. Uh, so more people will be off the street uh, as we go. We've done a lot of things, such as working with the Bureau of Prisons. We know everybody in prison, and we can tell when returns are coming from there. Uh, we are taking other steps and activities, some of them which we're not telling uh, the uh, criminal elements uh, what they are. Uh, part of it's been influenced by uh, uh, funding constraints in terms of the ability for us to update our systems. Uh, but we've uh, basically made strategic decisions to forego some uh, improvements on our systems to make sure that we continue to move forward on the, this front. Uh, one of the ironies to me, having now been living with this problem for a year, uh, is that it's now getting more visibility, which we're delighted uh, to have so that people can take care of their uh, information at a time when uh, the problem is much more under control than it was three or four years ago when nobody was really paying much attention to it. The core problem is that it's too easy to get a hold of a Social Security number. Uh, it used to be the death master file was a public record uh, so that uh, Social Security and insurance companies could know who had died. But those are the best Social Security numbers to have because when you file a false return, there's no competing return being filed. Uh, that's no longer, thanks to Congress, a public record. Uh, we, as I say, know everybody who's in prison uh, and are dealing with them. We've asked the Congress to get W-2s earlier. So we, will, we think we're going to continue to make a dent in the problem. It's no longer exploding. But we do advise taxpayers that then preparers and uh, those who work with them uh, to treat very carefully uh, private information. We are trying to, in fact, get everybody to only use the last four digits of Social Security numbers in notices. Well, when you get W-2s or notices in the mail, uh, when the mail gets lost, your Social Security number is lost uh, with it as it goes. We provide taxpayers who have had refund fraud uh, problems a new identity uh, protection pin that they use instead of their social security number, and we're running pilot programs to see what would happen, how many people would like those, uh, if we offered the uh, IP, IP pins to them as well. But to tell you the nature of the problem, increasingly when you read about data bre breaches and data thefts, it's not because people are trying to steal credit card numbers to go to Macy's, it's because they're trying to steal enough personal information to file false refunds. Uh, and we've had situations where tax preparers' uh, systems have been hacked uh, and that, of course, is a gold mine uh, for someone trying to file false returns because as we <coughs> test returns against prior filings and other information, if you've got uh, all the files out of a tax preparer's office, you've got all of that information. So again, uh, you are more effective at pretending uh, that you are the legitimate taxpayer. So I think for everybody it pays to take 
Uh, as much precaution as you can for preparers, I think whatever security systems you can involve are worth the money. Uh, and for everybody, never open an attachment, uh, even from a friend, if you don't know what it is and why they're sending it, uh, because that's the easiest way that systems are hacked. Uh, so it's a complicated problem. As I say, it's at uh, the top of our list. Uh, all I can tell you is I think we're making progress, but we've got a lot more work to do. Probably have time for maybe one more question. We have one more. That's right. Here we go. Ah, there we go. A volunteer. Uh, hello, Commissioner. Thanks for being with us. Uh, Howard Engel from uh, Illinois. Uh, this summer, uh, not a day went by bef without seeing some reference to inversions or inversion techniques. And then this fall, the Treasury uh, made it clear that they didn't believe the way that people were uh, interpreting uh, the code was appropriate and that this behavior was not consistent with good policy. Some people have suggested that inversions were just uh, dealing with the symptom of a bigger problem and that our approach to how we look at the international activities of our U.S. taxpayers is dated and, and needs to be addressed. What do you see as the next step in, in this ongoing conversation? Uh, it's another good question, uh, especially as I wander around the Hill, I keep reminding uh, everybody that <clears throat> we're involved in tax administration. Tax policy is the domain of the Treasury Department and the Congress. Uh, but having said that, disclaimer, then I can tell you that uh, <laughs> I think you're exactly right. And in fact, the Secretary of uh, the Treasury and the President uh, and many in Congress have noted uh, that the inversion problem really does reflect uh, fundamental problems in our uh, tax code and its application to uh, private companies. Uh, we're the only country, major country in the world with a global tax system, and we're the only ones with a tax rate at 35 percent. I just spent 10 days ago, three days in Dublin with uh, something called the Forum on Tax Administration, uh, which was 38 tax uh, commissioners from around the world, running from Russia through Europe through Japan and uh, China. And it's fascinating, we're all in the same business, which is trying to figure out how to increase compliance, how to move people onto online systems. And everyone is focused on uh, how to deal with the increasingly global economy and the companies that operate within it. So we're moving uh, to, uh, you know, and one of the things that surprised me, I was telling a group of executives this morning, is there's almost uni was almost uniform support for FATCA. Uh, which you would have thought, somebody would have been unhappy that here's a U.S. imposed kind of initiative. Uh, we have over 100,000 foreign financial institutions registered with us already, and people would have been objecting, well, that's just the U.S. again. But instead, literally all of these tax commissioners thought it was important because it's the first step of a global framework for information sharing. And they're focused on trying to get more information sharing about how the economy is running internationally. As that happens, there'll be even more pressure on us to actually rationalize the corporate tax code. As a general matter, uh, again, tax policy belongs to others, but as a general matter, our tax code is a mess. Uh, Dave Camp, uh, chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, came up with, I've been trying to figure out how to you know, explain how out of control it is uh, from when I was a law student a long time ago. And Dave had a great uh, sentence, he's, uh, way of doing it. He said, the tax code is 10 times bigger than the Bible with none of the good news. Uh, <laughs> And I told him I was going to give him credit for a year, and then I was stealing that line. Uh, <laughs> because it's actually true. Even on the individual side, as all of us know, uh, <clears throat> we've built uh, and layered barnacles onto this system in such a way that it is uh, a ship that can't be steered very well. So uh, I think one of everybody's hopes who's interested in this problem is that uh, when the dust settles, uh, the Congress will, if not being able to deal with tax reform across the board, at least be able to deal with corporate tax reform. And I think we're going to get pressured into that because uh, we've moved from concerns about double taxation internationally to now an international concern about no taxation. Uh, and once everybody gets on the same playing field, we're going to be back and worrying about double taxation uh, and the concerns of competitiveness or lack of competitiveness uh, by American companies as everybody starts to close the loopholes. And then it becomes a question of uh, what the effective tax rate is. So my hope is uh, that, as I've told the Congress, <clears throat> just as the tax administrators were happy uh, to help them with technical advice, because any changes, obviously, we have to in, uh, implement. And from our standpoint, uh, simplification would make everybody's life easier. Well, thank you all very much for your attention. I'm delighted to have been here.